Thank you for joining this OCCRL Pathways to Results Coffee Break webinar featuring moderator Dr. Jasmine Collins with panelists Derek D. Rhodes, Nashia Williams, and Paola Beltran Gutierrez. During the session, Dr. Collins and her guests talk about advancing racial equity in agricultural programs and industry. Dr. Collins is an assistant professor of organizational and community leadership in the Agricultural Leadership, Education, and Communications program at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. All right, we'd like to welcome everyone to our Pathways to Results webinar series. This is Dr. Marcy Rocky from the Office of Community College Research and Leadership. And this webinar is part of the Coffee Break series that we do related to um, our Pathways to Results projects supported by the Illinois Community College Board. So today we have perspectives from the pipeline, racial equity in agricultural education and industry. So we're really excited to have a panel discussion moderated by Dr. Jasmine Collins, Assistant Professor in the College of ACES at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And then we have our panelists, Derek D. Rhodes II, Agricultural Careers and Leadership Instructor and Junior Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources and Related Sciences Advisor at Chicago High School for Agricultural Sciences. We also have Nishia Williams, a graduate teaching assistant in the Agricultural Leadership, Education and Communications program. And we're also excited to have an undergraduate, um, Paolo Beltran Gutierrez um, from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and member of MANRRS and ALEC. And so I will turn it over to Dr. Collins. And if you do have a question, please use the chat box and I'll be responding as all the uh, participants um, or the people listening are, are going to be muted since we have a lot of interest. So I'll respond in the chat as I am able and I'll turn it over to Dr. Collins. Hi, thank you so much, Marcy. It was great to see you um, brief briefly as we were setting up for today's session. Um, and thank you to OCCRL for inviting us to share um, some of our insight and experiences related to um, racial equity in agricultural education and industry. So the session, um, overview. I know this is going to be slightly longer than the coffee break sessions that you all have been um, doing. It's going to be uh, closer to an hour, but um, we are going to kind of go through three primary questions for the webinar using uh, research and our panelists experiences to help us um, inform our discussions for these um, central questions. So the first question for today will be, what is the current state of the agricultural industry in the United States as it relates to youth secondary and post-secondary education? So kind of what are those connections there? Uh, what is racial equity and how does it show up in agricultural education and related sciences? And how is the agricultural industry working to recruit, retain, and promote employees from under, uh, underrepresented racial groups? Um, and then we will end the session with um, some time for audience Q&A. So if uh, you all who are listening right now, if you have questions, you can feel free to drop those in the chat box at any time. Um, we also have a few prompts if we have time to kind of throw back to the audience to get your perspectives as well. So should be a really great time. We're very excited and thank you again to um, my panelists for joining. Okay, so question one, what is the current state of the agricultural industry in the US as it relates to youth secondary and post-secondary education? So if you are joining us and you're not uh, really familiar with agriculture and the agricultural industry, I just wanted to provide a brief snapshot um, of the US landscape so you can get a sense of how um, broad and <laughs> vast uh, the agricultural industry is. So according to the USDA, agriculture and its related industries provide 11% of US employment. Um, so around 22 million full and part-time jobs. Uh, when you're thinking about the agricultural industry, we really are looking at two kind of groups of employees. So we're looking at um, self-employed as well as hired employees. So the focus of our presentation today is really going to be more so about the hired employees, particularly um, the aspects of the industry that require um, some kind of post-secondary education, but knowing that the agricultural industry does include um, farm work that doesn't necessarily require a degree or other aspects of the industry that don't necessarily require um, a college degree. But we do see just from this pie chart here that 
within the agricultural food and related industries, um, food service, eating and drinking, so restaurants, things like that, um, make up 12.8 million jobs. Um, and then we have um, farming, forestry, fishing and related activities, um, food, beverage and tobacco manufacturing, textile apparel and leather manufacturing, as well as food and beverage stores like grocery stores. So if you got dressed today, <laughs> if you drove, if you had coffee, if you ate anything, your life has already been touched by agriculture in some kind of way today, right? Um, within the state of Illinois, agriculture is the leading industry, um, contributing more than 8.85 uh, $8 billion dollars to the state economy annually. Um, so the agricultural industry employs about 1.5 million workers, and so um, we are one of the top states in the United in the United States in terms of um, our our reliance on um, agriculture and the agricultural industry and agricultural production. Um, that's because Illinois has great soil. Uh, we produce a lot of uh, crops, primarily, of course, corn, soybeans, um, and Illinois farmland covers about 75% of Illinois' total land area. So there is a lot of opportunity for growth in the agricultural industry as well. And according to the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, there are also about six main areas uh, which the state is focusing on for economic growth, including advanced manufacturing, agribusiness, food and processing, um, transportation distribution and logistics, life sciences and biotechnology, business and professional services and um, sustainable energy. And these are also uh, occupations and fields which uh, have clear linkages to um, post-secondary college completion as well. So the job outlook from um, 2015 to 2020, oh, sorry, a little typo there, but that is supposed to say 2020, um, the agricultural industry was projected to grow about 5% um, with uh, almost 58,000 58, um, new jobs annually for graduates with a degree in some kind of um, agriculture, food, environment, or a renewable energy um, a major or degree program. So there's a very high demand for um, students with uh, experience and um, education in agriculture with um, only about 61% of the projected jobs being uh, filled with um, our current sort of pipeline of who's who's coming through and who's getting degrees in agriculture and related sciences. Um, so as we see where the demand is sort of falling, 46% um, of the agricultural industry growth is being attributed to um, sort of management and, and business, um, management and agribusiness, um, followed by science and engineering at 27%, um, food and biomaterials production at 15%, and then um, agricultural education, communications, and government services at about 12% um, of that pie chart there. So as we can see, there's a lot of demand for um, college graduates in agriculture. Uh, within the United States, we do have um, an entire industry dedicated to agricultural education specifically. Um, so it's an important component of our public school education with approximately um, 1 million students participating in um, agricultural education programs uh, with nearly 12,000 secondary and two-year post-secondary teachers um, who are licensed to teach um, agriculture. And this is data coming from the National Association of Agricultural Educators. Within the state of Illinois, ag ed um, is also very prominent. So there are 345 total ad pro ag programs um, spanning from grades six through 12 within the state of Illinois, um, with over 19,000 um, registered FFA members and over 34,000 um, students who are currently enrolled in some kind of ag ed program. So we do see within the state of Illinois, again, um, very large reliance on the agricultural industry, um, very um, widespread agricultural education um, programs, and that's, very, that's something that's very important to um, our state. However, we know that not all students are going to have the same kind of exposure to agriculture and agricultural experiences. Um, so research so, shows that exposure to agriculture prior to college is really important for um, students to choose ag as a major. 
Um, so as we're seeing that there, there are some gaps there, there's that shortage that needs to be filled. We're only projected to fill about 61% of the open um, jobs that we have. It's gonna be important to make sure that we're understanding what's happening through that pipeline. And from a racial equity lens, also understanding the nature of participation and the experiences of students to help um, funnel and retain them through that pipeline. So if we said about a million youth um, have access to some sort of agricultural education programming in the United States, that's a really small percentage of the students who are actually in our public K through 12 system. Um, it's estimated that about 56 million um, <laughs> elementary through high school students are, um, are attending high school or uh, attending public school. Um, and so 1 million is a very small percentage of that. Um, but other exposure opportunities do exist for youth to become interested in agriculture, um, including hobbies, jobs, um, relatives that work in the industry, exposure through TV programs, or even um, participation in youth leadership organizations such as FFA, 4-H, and um, Junior Manor. So I wanted to ask our first question to the panel now that we've gotten a, a bit of a taste of what the landscape looks like, how pervasive this industry is, how it touches our lives, um, and how youth tend to be exposed to agriculture. My first question for the panel is what first inspired you to pursue a career in, in agriculture? And you can also feel free to share a little bit more about yourself as well um, in, in terms of like what your current role is and, and what you do. Okay, so I, I'll take it first. Um, my name is Derek Rose. I teach at the Chicago High School for Agricultural Sciences. And uh, the class that I teach is Agricultural Careers and Leadership. I teach ninth grade students. Um, so what inspired me to get into agriculture? Actually, I'm a graduate of the high school that I currently teach at the Chicago High School for Agricultural Sciences. And as a kid from the South Side of Chicago, I really didn't have much of an interest in ag going into high school at all. Um, what, what ended up turning me to agriculture once I became a student, there were two for two things. Uh, one, one of the first ag instructors I had, Ms. Lucille Shaw, uh, told the entire class, my freshman class at freshman orientation, to look to your left, look to your right, touch something in the room, think about what you ate, and pretty much understanding that this whole room came from agriculture in some form or fashion, from wood, uh, fibers that we wear on our body, from the food that we eat. So understanding that, I understood that pretty much I will always have a job if I follow this ag path. But anyway, I'm still a high, I'm still a high school kid and I'm, and I'm focused on what I want to do. I want to be a physical therapist. And what deterred me was that I wanted to go into physical therapy, but ag and physical therapy didn't really match. And I went to my first manners conference in Birmingham, Alabama in 2006. Uh, and I saw people that looked like me in agriculture for the first time in a huge forum. So it was over a thousand people that looked like me, talked like me. And then I realized that ag could finally be for me because I didn't see myself represented prior to that. Thank you for sharing, Mr. Rose. Um, so I'll go next. So for me, I wasn't actually a part of any agricultural programs as a youth, um, despite growing up in rural North Carolina. Um, my, the high school that I went to didn't actually have any agricultural classes. And I knew there was 4-H in my county, but I wasn't too familiar with what they did at the time. So initially, I was attracted to agriculture for the science component. Science was one of my favorite subjects. And in middle school, that's when my teacher first taught us about genetics. And I remember at the time, it was like the most fascinating thing I had ever, you know, heard about. And so from that moment, I knew I wanted to do something with genetics, but I just wasn't really sure what it was. So going, continuing to go throughout my education and into high school, that's when I learned about biotechnology and how it was being used in agriculture. And so I knew, okay, I think this is what I wanted to do. 
And so I was lucky enough to be able to have um, an internship in high school with a major ag company um, in biotech. And that kind of like solidified things for me. I knew, okay, I think now I want to go to college and pursue this and then continue to have a career in it as well. Okay, so it was really the science aspect that you were most passionate about that never mm -hmm. became your interest. Excellent. Hey. Hi everyone. Um, so I am an I am an incoming sophomore uh, in the ALEC program, and what first inspired me to pursue a career in agriculture was actually kind of similar to Mr. Rhodes, in the sense that I I didn't know about agriculture until I was in high school. So I also attended the Chicago High School for Egg Sciences in the South Side of Chicago, and um, it was really my ag teachers that made it sound so attractive for me. Um, I know that they made it sound like there was a space for me in whatever field I decide to go into. And I always really enjoyed people and um, kind of the agriculture came after that. I, I enjoyed learning about plants and learning about just the environment and how um, international agriculture is. And I wanted, I decided to um, go ahead and go into Alec. And so really happy to be here. <laughs> and we're very happy to have you. <laughs> um, okay, so you all shared a little bit about what, what got you first interested in agriculture and, and related sciences. Um, and um, Derek, you spoke about attending your first manners conference and how you really felt like, okay, well, there is a space for me here. I, I can belong here. I can see myself here. Um, and so we're going to shift gears a little bit to our second question, which is what is racial equity and how does it show up in agricultural and related sciences? Um, so my conceptualization of racial equity really comes out of um, what we think of as social justice more broadly, um, and social justice being defined as the goal of full and equal participation of all groups in a society that is mutually shaped to meet their needs. Um, and a social justice framework um, includes a vision of society in which the distribution of resources is equitable and all members are physically and psychologically safe and secure. So when we say the distribution of resources is equ equitable and um, society is shaped to meet the needs, it, it means that we're meeting the needs of people where they are. So that's that difference between um, equality and equity. You don't necessarily want to give everyone the same resources or everyone the same experiences across the board because our society is already inherently unequal. So if you give everybody the same thing, you're still going to have these, these vast inequalities in experiences and outcomes and opportunities, um, particularly based around race. Um, so we want to make sure that, that we are thinking about education that is equitable as in serving the needs of the students um, where, where they are. So some students may need something um, or some populations may, may need policies or experiences that are a little bit different to shape their needs or a little bit more um, to make sure that we are cultivating the diverse talent within the pipeline. So um, the next few slides, we will touch on a few of these aspects of racial equity and social justice um, being full and equal participation um, um, in industry, right? That shapes to meet the needs of the population and um, the psychological safety more so, thinking about our sense of belonging and, and how do we feel like we connect to agriculture and, and is there a potential disconnect there um, based on historical legacies of, of racial injustice. So I'm thinking about full and equal participation in the agricultural, um, in agricultural education and industry more broadly, I just wanted to draw a comparison between, along the lines of, of black, white racial lines historically, um, with some of the key sort of entry points into agricultural education being land grant institutions, so college, colleges and universities that were um, designed primarily for the purpose of cultivating um, scientists and farmers and scholars and those who would be able to understand natural sciences, physical sciences, mechanical arts, um, and agriculture, agriculture and industrial arts um, in particular, um, those being founded through the Morrill Land Grant Act of 1862. Um, but this land grant act, especially in the South, um, did not provide provisions for African Americans to obtain this same level of education or to even gain entry into the land grant institutions. Um, if you're not familiar with the land grant system, every state does have at least one land grant institution. 
um, the 1862 land grants are predominantly white or historically white in institutions. So in the state of Illinois, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign is Illinois' land grant institution. Um, Michigan State is the land grant at, at Michigan. Um, Purdue is the land grant at Indiana, for, you know, for example. Um, but then there was a second wave of legislation, the 1890 Moral uh, Land Grant Act, which actually forbade racial discrimination in admissions to colleges who were receiving the federal funds. Um, this was particularly um, an issue in the South, not to say that it was only an issue in the South, but University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, for example, never expressly forbade um, admission based on um, being of Black race but schools in the South did. So the 1890 Land Grant um, Act forbade racial discrimination, but also provided funds so that states could establish um, separate land grant colleges for African Americans. And this is what we know, know as um, historically black colleges and universities, so HBCUs. However, not all HBCUs are land grant institutions, um, but that's where that connection is there. So as we can see already from the very establishment of, of um, agricultural education in a post-secondary context, it was already divided along racial lines um, from the very founding of the institutions. We also have some key organizations, um, Future Farmers of America and New Farmers of America. Um, FFA had its first national convention in 1928. This was an organization that was res reserved exclusively for um, white men and they did not allow membership to open <laughs> to populations outside of just white men until um, 1965 when they merged with the New Farmers of America. And the New Farmers of America was the, the black organization for um, training and leadership development um, for, for black folks who were in the agricultural industry to help develop those um, skills, knowledge, and talent. So when uh, FFA and NFA merged, um, we kind of saw this decline in participation of um, African Americans in youth organizations such as FF, youth and leadership organizations such as FFA because a lot of the history, the traditions were kind of subsumed under this, this white organization and the um, black participants did not feel as though they could participate fully and equally. Um, we don't have time to even get into, of course, the, the legacy of um, forced agricultural labor in our country and how those, those cultural and historical vestiges still exist to kind of create even a, a mental or emotional barrier <clears throat> for folks of color to even want to be involved in the agricultural um, space. But that is certainly part of this as well. So if we're thinking about the ways that our current organizations, such as FFA, 4A, are shaped to meet the needs of members, we really do have to consider that racial piece because the foundation of these organizations were already racially discriminatory. So some research does show that um, the FFA does not represent the evolving demographics of America. Um, and I don't actually have the racial breakdown um, here in terms of the participation, but I'm sure our panelists can speak to, to some of that as well. Um, but in a recent, recent study, uh, white students reported that high school ag courses and FFA and 4-H participation were significant um, influences in their decision to pursue ag in college, but that was not the same for white students. And um, some research that was conducted by Martin and Kitchell in, in 2015 might be able to explain a little bit of that, as they say that students' perceptions of their cultural fit within an organization can influence their, participa their participation in such an organization. And in the context of FFA, um, this, the researchers write that FFA has not yet made significant progress in aligning the culture. So this culture of mostly rural, mostly thinking about production, um, agriculture in rural spaces, um, predominantly white. Um, it's not meeting the needs of, of these evolving um, students who are interested and passionate about agriculture, who are passionate about the science, who are passionate about urban agriculture, who wanna find themselves and, and connect in the ways that agriculture um, touches their lives. That FFA in particular, not to just like bash on FFA, it was just part of this study. Um, that there haven't been significant strides there to meet the needs of the diverse populations of students. 
Um, we also see within the agricultural education context on a secondary level, so high school agricultural education, um, that teachers from minority populations are, they're just greatly underrepresented. And within the state of Illinois as well, um, when we were pulling some of the literature together to put this presentation together, it's actually very difficult to even find disaggregated data by, by race. Um, most of the, the reports that we were trying to, to dig into to give us a sense of the, the landscape, even just within the state of Illinois, most of the data is disaggregated just male, female, and then maybe it will say like white and, and non-white or something like that, but we really can't even get a sense of like what the racial makeup is of even the agricultural education landscape in the state of Illinois. Um, but research does show that ethnic minorities and women would be more likely to participate in agricultural education or vocational education if individuals from their respective, you know, racial or ethnic identity or gender groups were actually visible to them um, in, in terms of instruction or supervisory roles, so teachers or employers. Um, so when you're pulling all of this together, you really start to think about, well, how welcome, how psychologically safe and secure, what is that sense of belonging that, that students of color feel when they're in, in these youth spaces? And how, how bad could it really be if, you know, we've made all these strides, uh, you know, in recent years um, to kind of let go of the, the discriminatory past. Um, but very, very recently, we can see that within FFA in particular, there are still a lot of strides to be made. Um, there was a, a national officer who was recently removed for posting some uh, racially insensitive or uh, derogatory um, posts on social media. And FFA also received some backlash for the way that they responded to um, the George Floyd um, and larger Black Lives Matter protests, um, or, or really more so the lack of the response. So just pulling this from their Facebook page, uh, they write, National FFA has been subject of has been the subject of criticism on social media over our stance or perceived lack thereof on inclusion, diversity, and equity in general, and on the Black Lives Matter movement specifically. We must do better has been the theme in emails and on social media. It's not enough, say others. The burden falls on all of us who want to make people from all races, ethnicities, and walks of life feel welcome in our country and to feel welcome in FFA. So in providing that background, I wanted to again come to our panel and ask um, if you all would, would not mind um, kind of describing the nature of your experiences and observations as a person of color, a woman of color, in these youth and high school agricultural spaces, such as um, high school ag, ag programs, FFA, or um, 4-H, and we'll, we'll start with that question there. So just how would you describe the nature of your experiences and observations? What's that been like for you? Um, I can start. <laughs> so, um... I would say like I, I had a taste of FFA in high school and um, I attended one national conference and that was more than enough for me to see the least. Um, after I was introduced to Manners, I realized that there's other organizations and there's other programs that want to make me feel welcome because in FFA and the environment, I, 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 I personally didn't feel like I belonged in, in with with the group just because you know i am from the city i am a person of color i am a mexican-american so there's a lot of times where um i don't know i felt almost like singled out you know or a lot of questions about um even like what i was doing in agriculture and i was going to be you know a farmer if my parents were farmers or things like that and i just felt like i wasn't welcome in the environment so um but it was until like uh, i was introduced to manners that i really saw a potential for a mentorship in, in a program like that. Thank you so much for sharing, Paula. So um, to answer this question, I, I think of it kind of twofold because I, as one time, at one point, like one point of time in my life was a youth in ag program, and now I'm an educator in ag program overseeing youth. So, um, but I, I'll answer this in a more recent sense with me being an educator. So 
every year, uh, I take a group of students down to the Green Hand Conference, which is freshman ag students um, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And we, I teach at a F, ethnic diverse uh, high school. So I maybe brought down 25 students with 15 of them being African-American. Um, and the students were being split up in groups, various groups randomly. There wasn't any um, rhyme or reason to how the students were truly split up into these, to these groups. And um, one of the young ladies that were on the trip, she was one of the last to get picked and she looked at her group and she ended up hearing her number called. Um, and then she, 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 she pretty much looked at me and said, I don't wanna go. I said, why don't you wanna go? And um, she said, because I'm the only black girl in the group, only black person in the group. And then it made me sit back and think and say, Derek, did you prepare your student for that experience that they were about to have? And so many other youth educators don't have to prepare their students for that kind of experience. And looking back on it, it's, it's so much weight, because like what Paula was talking about, the stairs, the, 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 amount of, um, the amount of discomfort one will feel in those settings will make you retract and not grab any of the content that is being delivered um, and want to pretty much, not disown, but um, retract from the organization or retract from being participatory. And um, I need, one observation is that I need to make sure that I prepare my students for the stairs, for the uncomfortable feeling, for the, the expression of your culture in that, in that setting. Yeah, and that's really unfortunate that it, it kind of falls on the the onus falls on you as the instructor and then on to the individual students to say, well, we have to do the extra extra work to armor up to be able to come into this space rather than thinking about organizationally, how can we create a welcoming environment and how can we do a better job to make sure that that folks who are already marginalized um, in terms of their gender, race, and other um, aspects of their identity don't have to then take on the additional <laughs> psychological burden of then having to um, navigate that space, with, which also comes with, um, you know, just psychological fatigue. And, and as you were saying, that feeling of just, okay, I don't even want to be here and I can't engage because I'm not comfortable enough to even take in the information. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, Nishia, did you want to add something to that? Uh, no, since I didn't have the experience of being in those youth programs, I can't speak of any personal um, experiences, but when I think back to when I was a kid, my high school that I went to didn't have FFA, but um, another high school that I have, would have went to if I didn't go to an early college did, and I know what their FFA um, you know, class looked like, and even with me having an interest in agriculture, I can't really say that I would have joined, you know, because it didn't seem like a space where I felt that I could be, you know, have that psychological safety. Right. Thank you so much. So for the second question of, you know, we've all heard at one time or another, like, they're just, they're just not that interested in agriculture when we're talking about youth of color, students of color, or just pe people of color in general, right? They're just not that interested. And then that becomes the, the justification for why there might be a lack of diverse racial representation within these spaces. Um, I was just wondering if you could all provide some comments or insight um, to, to whatever your response would be to that statement of youth are just not, youth of color are just not interested in ag. So um, I would say like this misperception that youth of color aren't interested. Um, it's not that they're not interested, it's just in many cases, there's not the exposure or the information, you know. Um, this, you know, especially in urban areas sometimes, but it can happen in rural areas as well, you know, if there um, is no FFA or if they don't feel like they can join it, you know, 
you can't be interested in something if you were never exposed to it, you know? And then like our food system is set up so we don't really have to think about where our food comes from, you know? We just, if eating is like a passive, you know, thing, then you're not gonna think about how that impacts you every day. Um, also going back to like the imagery, imagery being so powerful for children. So these organizations are already in place, but the kids who are in it, you know, don't look like you. The people who are in charge don't look like you. And then you don't have as much outreach. You know, you feel like they're not even reaching out to people that look like you. Then as a child, you know, or even as an adult, you're just naturally going to think that this isn't for me. And to add on to that, with not only the exposure, but when you think about the term, well, the phrase that they aren't all that interested in agriculture, research shows that specifically uh, African-American males um, gravitate towards kinesthetic learning opportunities. And agriculture possesses plenty of kinesthetic learning opportunities um, within the curriculum. So um, to say that we are not interested is um, ignorant in, in understanding the way that we process information. Um, and it is once again, it's exposure and also understanding that in order to have a, have an interest in the education setting, that teacher must also have an interest or that, that uh, the educator must also have background knowledge or experiences in said field. I can't go into a classroom and teach computer science with any confidence because I don't have any background in computer science. So if you're looking for um, African-American students to, to, that are on the city, in the city of Detroit to have an experience and want to be in agriculture, they're not going to have a point of reference because it's not only do they not have a point of reference, but their educators don't have a point of reference either. Yeah, that's a really good point. Did you want to add something, Paula? No, I think Mr. Rhodes and, and okay. she have kind of summed it up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so in transitioning and thinking through the, the pipeline, so we talked a little bit about youth. Um, but there's also a need to feel a sense of belonging within, within college spaces as well. Um, and in interest of time, I didn't pull a whole lot of data. Um, I just did pull a, a snapshot just of the College of ACES um, in comparison to the undergraduate enrollment at um, our campus uh, total, total in total. So we see that within the campus, um, about 41% of our total undergraduate um, enrollment is uh, 41.3 percent of undergraduates are white on campus um, and we see that the College of Aces is is higher <laughs> much higher than that actually um, 56 percent of the College of Aces um, in terms of the undergraduate enrollment um, is white students so um, about 5.8 percent black students 14 percent um, Hispanic and 8.1 percent Asian American um, the College of Aces is also not it's not that that big, <laughs> um, relatively. I didn't pull the raw numbers, but um, I think enrollment is somewhere around like 2,000 students, something like that. Um, so when you get, when you're getting down to five percent, six percent of of 2,000, you know that's a couple hundred students essentially um, throughout the entire enrollment. So even though it, representation of the student body is not the only indicator of racial equity. Uh, we do know that just on a national scale that the agricultural field, it, it is just, it is very white. Um, and so since each of you had experiences um, attending college at a predominantly white institution, um, I just wanted to know if you could share a little bit about your experiences as um, a college student of color at a predominantly white institution in an agricultural space. Um, and if there were particular causes for concern for you um, and where those areas were that you were able to find support through, throughout your journey. Uh, 
Okay, so I'll take this one first. Um, so uh, I've attended North Carolina State University as an undergrad. Um, and in general, uh, on a broad scale, my experiences were positive in the sense that I had a lot of opportunities, be, you know, just from going to a land grant university. However, when I looked at it on like a smaller scale, um, there were a lot of times where I experienced, you know, self-doubt and questioning, you know, do I belong here? So I studied crop sciences as an undergrad and I was the only African-American undergrad in my whole department until my senior year. Um, all my professors were white men except for two. I had two female teachers and then only one was a ethnic minority. So, um, you know, now I'm in a completely different part of the country um, in an ag college, but um, not much has changed. Um, but now that I am in ed education, though, there is, um, there are, I have a lot more female professors. But um, I guess what was most concerning to me is that, you know, I'm in these spaces and I'm clearly seeing, okay, these demographics don't match what the United States is looking like, but I didn't see um, a lot of effort um, in trying to change those demographics on like a departmental level, you know, all ag, you know, colleges, you know, typically have, you know, a office of diversity, but, you know, within the actual departments, it didn't seem like um, there was a lot of effort being put into increasing the diversity within their department, um, you know, especially in like the crop sciences. No one recruited me. Um, it was, I just happened to be a black person who was interested in crop sciences. And so I applied and got in, you know, it was almost this feeling of like sliding through a cracked door, you know, and not so much that I have any, you know, that feeling from professors, but from my peers, a lot of the time there was always this vibe or this like feeling of, oh, I wonder, you know, how, you know, why she's here or how, how did you end up here? Um, and then just in answering the question about like support, um, what helped me in those instances when maybe I didn't have like a person of color as a professor to look to was having professors, you know, who were allies, who took the time to, um, uh, I guess they weren't afraid to acknowledge that you might be having an experience that's different from the other students here you know, um, took the time to find out what I wanted to get out of my time being there, seeing as though I wasn't, you know, just one of the other farm kids. So that made like a, a big difference. Also, um, as the other panelists have spoken about, I was a part of Manners as an undergraduate as well. And just being able to go to like their national conferences and, you know, seeing a bunch of other people that were like me who were interested in agriculture, which I had not experienced until I joined the organization. It kind of helped me, you know, to power through. I feel like organizations like Manners um, are what keep a lot of undergraduate students of color in ag spaces from just throwing in the towel and changing their major. Um, yeah, adding on to what Nishia kind of said. Um, so my experiences, um, I'm, again, it is my first year and it was kind of cut short, <laughs> but it's been a mixture of negative and positive. Um, I think the positive is that definitely it's, you know, it's a different environment. Um, I've had lots of different experiences that I'm really, really grateful for. Um, but some negative is, at least for me, it's been a lot of um, like microaggressions and uh, microaggressions for those who might not know are just, um, I guess, like discriminatory comments, not specifically saying like, oh, like you don't belong here, but in your actions and your certain projects or your certain words, you know, telling me that. So it was a lot of um, dismissive attitude in the classroom in a lot of my ad classes, where um, again, I am a person that's from Chicago. So a lot of the content that's talked about in class, even though I did attend a, a, an agriculture high school, is um is different you know there's a lot of jargon that i might not understand um and also just you know being a latina like it's just my experiences are very different from a man that's from rural illinois so um it's just like the constant dismissive attitude for me in the classroom and um what was i guess concerning for me was the fact that there was a point in time in my first semester that i was like this is not for me like this you know um as much as i like agriculture like is it really what i want to do 
I was thinking of just going to a different program or a different college, you know, because um, I'm um, minoring in Latino studies and it's just, it's a very different environment, it's a different atmosphere. Um, it's a complete opposite to me, to be honest. It's very welcoming. Um, I feel very appreciated in the classroom and it's not something that I felt in, in my ad classes. But um, again, with my support, I had, um, it, it really does take a village, you know, um, I had mentors outside of the college, I had mentors in the college, um, manners really helped me out. I mean, it was really like a safe haven, like you go after, after classes and you just kind of um, really sit with people who look like you and the mentors and the advisors running that are, are people of color as well. So it, it really took a lot of support for me to just like understand that um, my, my experiences are as valid as anybody else's and um, which is what kind of helped me, you know, I guess still be here today. Um, and so, so yeah, thanks. Thank you so much for sharing. So when I was an undergrad at, at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign back in 20, what was it, oh, oh, nine, 2009, <laughs> so 2009, <laughs> Uh, to 2012 is when I was a, a, a ag ed major. I came in as a fishing major, food science, human nutrition uh, major, and then moved to ag ed. But when I moved to ag ed, um, I probably had an experience that is unique to anyone in America in ag ed at the time as an undergraduate student because I had two black male professors in the ag ed department with me at that time that were with me all the way up until graduation. Um, so to, to have that additional support, to know that uh, even though that is a lot of times it was three of us in class, it was the educator, it was the teacher, uh, myself and the, my best friend in college, um, all of us in class at the same time. And Ag it was three and everybody else was um, <clears throat> a white male or female. It was, uh, it was an opportunity for me to have support that was probably not seen for, uh, for other black students in Ag Ed at a PWI, um, knowing that my, the, the, my professor knew my plight, understood how to address me, respected me as a person, not as a student, um, which, which speaks volumes um, to, to understanding your place at, in the classroom. Like, you know, are you going to respect me if I wasn't in this class? And I honestly felt that way with uh, both professors at Illinois at the time. And then uh, my advisor was also, not my advisor, but my mentor at the University of Illinois, Dr. Jesse Thompson, um, is an ag ed uh, PhD as well. So understanding that I had a place because they had a place allowed me to, to, mu to muscle through uh, and, and get a, a degree that a lot of people that look like me probably don't get from a PWI. Um, and uh, I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, it, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your experiences. Um, and I, I love what you just said there, Derek, about I, I had a place because they had a place and that's and when we talk about the pipeline right and like trying to widen that and make sure that we're able to to bring students through that it does take folks who are in positions of power um not only for the representation because you you know you can't be what you can't see right but because having folks in power who have those kinds of experiences can then help shape recruitment efforts policy they can um Unfortunately, faculty of color, we often bear the brunt of having to do sort of the diversity education work as well, right? But we can take that upon ourselves as well to help our colleagues understand, like, this is a racial microaggression. This is, it when you do this in the classroom, right? Like, this is how your students of color feel. You might not be cognizant of it because you don't have that same experience or or you're doing it, you know, maybe it's, it's a comment that you didn't realize was, was derogatory in some kind of way, right? Or that you know, even in faculty meetings, I've heard like, oh, you know, I was slaving all day over the stove or whatever. And you're just like, can you not, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, can you not like use that kind of language, you know, but it's something that they're not really connecting, right? It's just kind of like something that's, that, that might be the phrasing or just the way they've always done things or something like that. So 
having people of color in positions of power um, is very important. Um, so we do have one last question, but I, I want to leave a little bit of time for Q&A, so I'll just run through this fairly, fairly quickly. But how is the agricultural industry working to retain, recruit, and promote employees from under, underrepresented racial groups? I would also say to those who are listening, if you do have questions, this would be a great time to drop them in the chat, um, and maybe we can get to a couple of them. We just have about 10 minutes left in our session. so. Um, so just really quickly um, for this question, how is the agricultural industry working to recruit, retain, and promote employees from underrepresented racial groups? Um, we, draw, we drew on this workplace diversity survey um, from 2018, which surveyed 82 organizations across a variety of agricultural sectors um, in 28 states um, in 2018. And uh, they found that 85% of employers, they don't have some kind of dedicated staff um, that's dedicated exclusively to diversity efforts. So as Nashia was saying, even in the college context, right? It's like when you were looking around in your experiences, you didn't get the sense that they were taking this uh, sort of seriously. There was nobody whose responsibility or job it was to kind of um, be in charge of the, of the diversity related efforts, right? Um, and 53% of the organization, so just a little over half, um, indicated that their recruiting strategies were specifically aimed at increasing diversity, which means that about half of these 82 um, agricultural industries don't have any recruiting strategies that are aimed specifically at increasing diversity. Um, also, this survey found that as organizations conceptualize diversity, um, between 44 and 65% of organizations actually do consider race as a, as a dimension of diversity that, that they consider just sort of in their conceptualization of what it means to have a diverse organization. Um, so there, that does mean that there is still a gap there in terms of organizations not really putting race at the forefront in terms of thinking about diversity. Maybe they're still thinking about um, what we would call a psychological diversity, right? Like, oh, diversity of thought, or maybe diversity of experience, right? Or diversity of, of background, more generally speaking, but not really specifically focusing on race. Um, when they were asked about their challenges in recruiting diverse candidates, um, they cited that there was just a lack of diverse applicants. Um, and if anyone here is familiar with, with DNI or DEI work, we know that lack of diverse applicants is, <laughs> is very, very rarely um, the problem, right? That's kind of blaming like the, the individuals again, right? And it's um, really, maybe you should be mo more so paying attention to where you are looking for your candidates, right? As opposed to just throwing up your job on a job board or something like that, you need to go and, and find out where the, the racially diverse candidates actually are. Um, and so as we're looking down this chart of, um, three and four, um, so there's a, uh, or four in particular, lack of diverse candidates targeted at universities. Um, and we might have a little bit of time to get into that as well. But when our, our panelists were getting ready for this um, presentation, we talked about how an institution like the University of Illinois, there is, we have Research Park right here, right? We're in the state of Illinois where agriculture is such a pervasive industry and our institution is tied to agricultural research. Um, so we have those industry partnerships. When there's a, a career fair that's going on here, I mean, everybody who is anybody in ag is here trying to recruit the best and brightest from the University of Illinois. What kind of recruitment efforts are happening at a Tuskegee, for example, right? Like, is, is there that same fervor, that same energy to go out and find um, the students who are at, at a historically black college versus at a University of Illinois? Um, and then also this point number six, difficulty of recruitment staff forming a connection with candidates, which is something that Derek spoke to as well as being really important, right? It's like, if you don't know if you really wanna be in this space or maybe you're on the fence, if you make a connection with somebody who you're like, wow, they get me, they understand where I'm coming from, they value me as a person, I would have a good experience here and I would be supported. Uh, most organizations are saying they're not really seeing that they're able to connect with, with diverse candidates, whatever that that necessarily means. Um, okay, and then also just something that I wanted to point out here um, as we're thinking about the pipeline, right? 
we can see in this chart that most of the racial diversity in these organizations is kind of pooling at the bottom of like interns and um, like full-time hourly employees, <laughs> um, things like that. But 78% um, of the employers who were surveyed said that 95% of their executive staff is white, essentially. Um, so as we're thinking about the pipeline and, and not just recruitment and retention, but also promotion, why is it that for the racial diversity that you might have within your organization, that it's all kind of bottlenecking at, at the bottom of the organization and what are those opportunities for um, promoting up, up the ranks. Um, we're gonna skip this question just because we have about five minutes left. So this is a great um, opportunity if the audience has any questions. Also, this uh, will be recorded and we do have a couple of, of questions. Um, if we're, we don't have a chance to talk about them today, um, you can shoot me an email to, to give us a response to this if you would like, or um, just something to, to take away as you're, as you're leaving the session today. But I'll turn it over to Marcy now. Sure, so, <clears throat> excuse me, we do have a couple questions from um, the chat. So the first one is, um, if you could wave a magic wand to create change, what would you like to see happen? And that question comes from Lucas Allen. I'll, I'll take a, a stab at this one. Uh, hey, Luke. So um, thanks for the question. Actually, we, we had this sort of a answer to this question at the dinner table last night, wife and I were sitting talking. And um, if I had a magic wand, one thing that I would like to see uh, occur is at the K through 12 level, this is not ag related, but K through 12 nationwide, for us to have um, departments of inclusion or departments of culture um, at each school where the students select their own course to take, but just how there's a requirement um, for phys ed, there's a requirement for fine arts. There needs to be multiple years of Latinx, uh, African American studies, diaspora, um, all these you can do Native American studies, indigenous people studies, to, to, to put the onus in the, in the classroom at a young age. Um, because you, I was looking at, a, I'm taking a lot of time, but I was looking at a post um, yesterday and it was talking about Ruby Bridges and, and like she's only 65 years old. Then <laughs> to, to understand that the woman that, uh, that segregated schools, I mean, desegregated schools is only 65 years old. So we have to understand that these are still the same people that are up at the top of these organizations. So we gotta, we gotta create a new pipeline of culturally inclusive individuals and it starts in the schools. So if I had a magic wand, that's what I would do. Thank you. And that actually is a, a really good segue to our second question, and then we'll have to um, wrap it up, but we will give email information. So um, Brandy Neal asked, how can FFA, 4-H, et cetera, build or create partnerships with schools who have a high percentage of racially ethnic individuals to create a more diverse population in these spaces? Um, I'll take a stab at this one too. Thank you, Brandy. Um, I think it just has to start with with reaching out. You know, if you know that these um, you know schools exist in your community that may have more diverse students, then I think it just starts with like reaching out and trying to like have a partnership because I feel like. Um, there will never be that many uh, people of color in leadership positions if you if it doesn't start with the youth, you know, like role models are so powerful for the youth. So you have to get them interested in going to college, you know, and studying it in college. And then once they get in college, you know, and make it to the industry, if there's still so few, you know, those few won't even be visible, 
you know, to the youth. And so it's like this cycle, you know, that has to start with the youth, you know, this pipeline to industry, you know, this pump will sustain itself, but, you know, you have to prime it first. You have to get the youth in the door so they can get to the top and inspire more youth to continue. I have something to, to add on to that. Um, so you, you, if you, I think about junior manners in this, in this, in this, in this space where you have FFA and 4-H, but they don't necessarily will, will match the demographics that uh, the school that you're trying to get into these organizations into, but junior manners does. Um, minorities in agriculture, natural resource and related sciences, feel free to contact me um, after this, um, this, this webinar for more information about how to get a junior manners chapter started. But the, like the state of Kentucky, they merged their 4-H and junior manners together. So the programs run succinctly in order to get that exposure for the black and brown students to understand that they have a place. Thank you so much um, for, uh, for Dr. Collins for facilitating and to our panelists for being here. I know that um, we're at time, um, but this has been a great webinar. I know I've certainly um, learned a lot that will inform our work um, as we work with community colleges in Illinois and beyond, and also as we look to advance equity throughout uh, P20 education. So thank you all for being here. Please stay connected with us, and I will be sending an, uh, information on how to access the recording um, once it's available through OCCRL. So thank you, and we will be in touch. Thank you. Thank you for joining this OCCRL Pathways to Results Coffee Break webinar supported by the Illinois Community College Board. Be sure to check our website at occrl.illinois.edu to discover upcoming and past webinars.